such as Jesus being the Christ? Answer. In other translations, Greek and Arabic, the suspicious statements contain disclaimers such as Jesus who was believed to be the Christ and it has been reported. This presents the theory that Josephus was recording the beliefs regarding Jesus and not necessarily his personal opinion, as a responsible historian should do. If anything, it could lead to the speculation that Christian authors did not add to the text, but rather edited it by deleting the disclaimers. You should also realize that the earliest versions of Antiquities contain this passage as it is presented in the first case. The objection usually is that the earliest copy is not until the 10th century. However, we do have several citations of this passage by other authors prior to the 10th century. Skeptic Interjection 2. Early Christian authors like Origen and Justin Martyr do not mention this passage in their writings. Answer. I'm not sure what the motive behind this objection is because Origen does reference the other passage by Josephus, yet critics claim the reference is too late to be reliable. But, for the argument's sake, if we assume this passage did exist in the form most scholars believe it did, the early church fathers might not have felt the need to refer to it. The original passage serves as evidence for the historicity of Jesus, a topic not debated at this point, as the burden of proof revolved around his divinity. We will now examine the second passage given to us by Josephus. Fortunately, it is not surrounded in as much controversy. It says, So, Aeneas assembled a council of judges, and brought before it the brother of Jesus, the so-called Christ, whose name was James, together with some others, and having accused them as lawbreakers, he delivered them over to be stoned. Skeptic Interjection 1. Is it possible this passage was a forgery by early Christians? Answer. It must be noted that no copy of Antiquities has ever surfaced without the above text quoted as it is above. Critics are suspicious of the so-called Christ statement, yet this reference, rather than the Christ, shows Josephus was not condoning the belief, but simply documenting it. Also, this passage concerns the, the actions of the priest Aeneas. Jesus and James were not even the primary focus of this verse. Lastly, this passage is cited in other early works which attest to its auth authenticity. Even if we dismiss the disputed works in Josephus' testimonium, we still see he testifies to a number of things in the above two passages. One, that Jesus lived for, in the first century. He performed miracles. Some believe Jesus to be the Christ. He was a teacher. He had many followers. He was tried by Pilate. He was crucified. He was the founder of Christianity. And, he, and James was the brother of Jesus. Next is Pliny the Younger. Pliny the Younger admits to torturing and executing Christians who refused to deny Christ. Those who denied the charges were spared and ordered to exalt the Roman gods and curse the name of Christ. Pliny addresses his concerns to Emperor Trajan that too many Christians were being killed for their refusal to deny their faith. He says, I asked them directly if they were Christians. Those who persisted, I ordered away. Those who denied that they were or ever had been Christians worshipped both your image and the image of the gods and cursed Christ. They used to gather on a stated day before the dawn and sing to Christ as if he were a god. All the more I believed it necessary to find out what was the truth from two servant maids, which were called deaconesses, by means of torture. Nothing more did I find than a disgusting fanatical superstition. Therefore, I stopped the examination and hastened to consult you on account of the number of people endangered, for many of all ages, all classes, and both sexes already are brought into danger, in Pliny's letter to Emperor Trajan. Though Pliny states some of the accused denied the charges, a recurring theme in the correspondences between Pliny and Trajan is the willingness of the true believer to die for Christ. This would hardly be reasonable if they knew he never existed. Skeptic Interjection 1 How does dying for one's belief verify the actual existence of Jesus? The sincerity of a belief does not necessarily make the belief true. How does this passage specifically confirm a historical Jesus and not just the existence of Christians in Rome? Answer: Pliny states Christians worshipped Christ as if he were a god. This indicates one who would not normally be considered a god, 
such as a human who was exalted to divine status. Also, the early Christians would have been in a position to know if Jesus was a historical figure or not. Though critics can claim these martyrs took Jesus' existence solely on faith, common sense tells us that there would have been a lot more evidence of a historical Jesus at this time than what has been preserved until today. According to early historians, Jesus' great nephew and other relatives were still alive, as well as the associates of the original apostles. Such individuals could easily verify his existence. Also, documents which have been lost to us were still in existence, such as Jesus' trial records and the census records of his birth, and were even referenced by early authors who wrote about Jesus. These individuals had every reason to be certain of Jesus' existence and were willing to die because of it. Skeptic Interjection 2 Pliny also states some recanted their testimony. Perhaps they did so because they knew Jesus was a myth. Answer. There are several rational explanations as to why some would recant their Christian beliefs. Pliny readily admits to torturing some of the accused. Are admissions or denials really credible under torture? Also, the accused knew if they did not recant, they would be put to death. Fallible human rationalization, confess and go home, and work out the hard feelings with Jesus later, or suffer crucifixion. Also, some of the accused could have been lackadaisical Christians who half-heartedly accepted Christianity because of a spouse, parent, or friend, and would have had no problem reverting back to paganism upon facing persecution. These there were half-hearted Christians 2,000 years ago, just like there are half-hearted Christians today. Just because there were some who may have recanted out of fear or poor judgment, doesn't dismiss the deaths of the other individuals who were certain of Jesus' existence, and died because they refused to curse him. Next is Celsus. Celsus was a 2nd century Roman author and an avid opponent of Christianity. He went to great lengths to disprove the divinity of Jesus, yet never denied his actual existence. Unfortunately for Celsus, he sets himself up for crit criticism by mimicking the exact accusations brought against Jesus by the Pharisees, which had already been addressed and refuted in the New Testament. There are two very important facts regarding Celsus which make him one of the most important witnesses in this discussion. Though most secular passages are accused of being Christian interpolations, we can accept with certainty that this is not the case with Celsus. The sheer volume of his writings, specifically designed to discredit Christianity, coupled with the hostile accusations presented in his work, dismiss the chance immediately. Also, the idea of Celsus getting his information entirely from Christian sources, another reoccurring accusation against secular evidence, is wholly absurd. He is obviously aware of his opponent's belief, as anyone who is engaging in a debate should be. Celsus wrote his exposition in a form of dialogue between a, quote, Jewish critic and himself. This gives us cause to believe that he used non-Christian, probably Jewish, sources. On Jesus' miracles, he writes, Jesus, on account of his poverty, was hired out to go to Egypt. While there, he acquired certain magical powers. He returned home, highly elated at possessing these powers, and on the strength of them gave himself out to be a god. It was by means of sorcery that he was able to accomplish the wonders which he performed. Let us believe that these cures, or the resurrection, or the feeding of a multitude with a few loaves, these are nothing more than the tricks of jugglers. It is by the names of certain demons and by the use of incantations that the Christians appear to be possessed of miraculous power. Not only does Celsus confirm Jesus' existence here, he also tries to debate the source of his miracles. Like the Pharisees of Jesus' day, Celsus tries to dismiss these miracles as both demonic possession and cheap parlor tricks. However, he is clearly grasping at straws. On one hand, Celsus accuses Jesus of performing magic learned in Egypt, then later states it is by the power of possession, then states the miracles were not really miracles at all, but were illusionary tricks performed by a deceiver, then finally states that the miracles never occurred. On the virgin birth, he writes, Jesus had come from a village in Judea, 
and was the son of a poor Jewess who gained her living by the work of her hands, his mother had turned out 